Welcome to the Man of Recaps. This is Ozark seasons one through three, leading up to the fourth and final season. Meet Marty Bird, a mild-mannered financial advisor in Chicago, but Marty has a secret. For years now, he's been laundering money for a Mexican drug cartel. Tonight, they're summoned by their contacts, Dell, because Marty's partner, Bruce, has been skimming money for himself, which is a big no-no. Now, Marty legitimately didn't know, but the cartel's gonna kill him anyway, so he starts spewing whatever nonsense he can to try to save his life. He randomly had a brochure for the Lake of the Ozarks in his pocket, so he starts rambling. This is a money laundering paradise. Let me keep working for you. I'll do way more than I was doing here. Dell knows Marty's scrambling, but he's curious. He's like, okay, you bought yourself three months to launder $8 million. If you fail, we'll kill you then. So Marty uproots his family and they all move down to beautiful Missouri. Now the birds had a pretty normal family life. Marty's wife, Wendy, knew about the laundering, but they were never supposed to be in any real danger. Actually, their marriage was in a rough spot right now because Marty just found out she was having an affair. But the cartel does not like complications, so Marty and Wendy have more pressing issues now. The kids are too smart to buy their parents' weird excuses for this move, so almost immediately, Wendy gives up. Your father's laundering money for a Mexican drug cartel and they might kill us all. So the birds buy their new lake house, which which comes with its former owner, Old Man Buddy, who's dying soon anyway. His naked morning swims just add to the rustic charm. Now, what is money laundering? Basically, you take your cash from illegal drug dealing, mix it in with a legitimate business, you can't tell what's what, the government can't seize it. So Marty needs a business to launder through, and the winner is the Blue Cat Lodge. Its current owner is Rachel, and business isn't great, but Marty's like, hey, let me invest, I'll turn it around, and she's like, hey man, sure, good luck. But there was a huge problem back on day one when the cartel cash was stolen out of Marty's motel room. Marty quickly finds the culprits, a local family of lowlifes, the Langmores. Now, the Langmores aren't exactly criminal masterminds, except Ruth, who's real street smart and extremely foul-mouthed. They give the money back for now, but Ruth's gonna play the long game, have Marty teach her how to launder money, then kill him and take it. She convinces Marty to take her on as an assistant and becomes his curly-haired Jesse Pinkman. So it's all going well at the Blue Cat, but not nearly well enough to meet the cartel's deadline, and Marty realizes he's gonna have to play dirty. There's a strip club in town, and it becomes apparent the owner's already using it to launder money of his own. So Marty gives Ruth her first task, break in and steal the safe. And Ruth's got that, no problem. She gives some cash to underage kids, then calls the cops, while the owner's gone, they get the safe easy peasy. But Marty's not looking for cash. He takes the title to the guy's fake shell corporation, and because it's all illegal, he can't do anything. Marty's the proud new owner of a strip club. That's not Marty's scene, though, so he puts Ruth in charge as manager, a job she's incredibly good at. But now Marty has messed with the business of the local crime lords, the Snells, who have got secret poppy fields out on their farm. That's heroin. Jacob Snell is a pretty nice guy, who if you ask him how it's going, he'll launch into a 20-minute story about how the power company flooded his family off this land 200 years ago. But it's his wife Darlene, who you really want to watch out for. She's a full cycle path who will kill you soon as look at you. Now the Snells self-identify as hillbillies, and I couldn't tell you the difference between these two words, but they really don't like being called rednecks. More on that later. So Jacob Snell introduces himself to Marty and tries to intimidate him, but Marty's like, sorry, I work for the Mexican cartel. Nice to meet you though. Now Marty still needs more ways to launder money, and construction's always a good option. There's a local pastor who preaches out on the water, and it's like, hey, why don't we build you a church? But Marty didn't know that's how the Snells distribute their heroin out on the water where there's no cop interference. So the Snells have a less friendly meeting with Marty where it's like, hey, maybe we can't touch you but if you don't get that preacher back on the water, we're gonna cut that baby out of his nice pregnant wife. Meanwhile, the FBI's in town, and they can't prove it, but they know exactly what Marty's up to. So coming in undercover is Agent Petty. His target is Russ Langmore, Ruth's uncle. They become fishing buddies, and Petty puts it out there that he's gay. Now at first, Russ is very homophobic, because turns out he's gay too. Now as Marty trusts Ruth with more responsibility, she starts to really like her boss, but there's someone she wants to impress even more, her father, Cade Langmore, who's in prison and a real bad dad. So she's going through with her plan to kill Marty by electric Electrifying his doc, make it look like an accident. But oh, luckily it doesn't work. Agent Petty heard about the plan from Russ and dewired it. Wendy the season starts working for a realtor who's a real sissy mom's boy. But one day she's sassing him a little too hard. Ho walks into the street and hit by a garbage truck. And when Wendy sees how inflated funeral costs are, she buys a funeral home to help with the money laundering. So Marty and Wendy working together, which can strain a marriage in the best of circumstances. Sometimes things are good as the threat of imminent death brings them closer together. But other times things are bad as they get into some truly epic shouting matches. They average out at a baseline of let's just try to survive. Now, in the great tradition of Breaking Bad, it's time for family breakfast where we check in on the kids. Their teenage daughter Charlotte is generally not taking the situation very well, but their younger son Jonah takes it almost too well. He reads all about money laundering and wants to help the family business. Jonah becomes good friends with old man Buddy who teaches him how to shoot guns. Charlotte goes down to Party Cove and hooks up with a frat boy even though she's only 16, but the next day he leaves town without saying goodbye. It's like, yeah, the tourists always leave. So Charlotte befriends a local, Wyatt Langmore, Ruth's cousin, who's actually really smart, loves books. His younger brother, whose name
same as three, not so much. Now, as Marty hits his three month deadline, he's actually pulled it off, laundered more money than anyone thought possible. As a reward, the cartel gives him even more cash to launder, so this is his life for the foreseeable future. Now, Marty's become close with Rachel at the Blue Cat, and dare I say, they're a little flirty. But when she finally checks the books and sees what Marty's up to, she's pretty mad, but Marty's like, we can't stop or the cartel will kill us all. When she realizes he's not exaggerating, she finds the hidden cash in the wall, grabs a big sack, and pieces out of there. Then Russ Langmore has really fallen for Agent Petty. They make plans to open a fishing shop together, and it seems Agent Petty's kind of fallen for Russ too, which makes it all the more awkward when he reveals he's a narc. He wants to use Russ to get to Ruth to get to Marty, but Ruth's too smart for that, figures out he's wearing a wire. Russ doesn't see a way out of this, so he thinks the best plan is to kill Marty Bird now, take his cash, and run. But Ruth figures out what he's up to, so when they get to the blue cat, oh, she electrified the dock! Ruth murders her uncles to save her mentor Marty. She really loves her cousin Wyatt, and now she's got a lie about killing his dad. Agent Petty also does not take the news very well. There's yet another problem when the pastor resumes construction on the church. The only way Marty can make him stop is by telling him what the Snells are up to. He won't stand for this, he stops preaching, and Jacob Snell's like, Marty, this was your fault, because they did exactly what they said they were gonna do. He finds his baby delivered, but his wife gone. With all the craziness here, Marty's like, hey, Wendy, take the kids and run. But running unexpectedly is against the cartel rules. Luckily, old man Buddy's here to cover their escape. But when that guy doesn't check in, Del comes to town for some good old-fashioned toenail removal. Marty doesn't break, though, so Del trusts him. So they have a sit-down with the Snells. Marty's got a plan how they can all work together. If the Snells flood some of their land, they'll connect to the river, and then they can build a riverboat casino. Casinos are the best way to launder a ton of money, and in exchange, the cartel will handle distribution on the Snells' heroin. Now, this is a great deal for all parties, so everything's gonna work out. But Del, also not knowing how it's different from a hillbilly, calls them rednecks, and oh, Darlene does not take kindly to that. So Marty calls his wife, hey, things are not gonna quiet down here. You guys should run for good. But the kids don't wanna leave their dad behind. They're like, hey, if we're all in danger, at least we'll be in it together. So they decide to come home and stick it out in the Ozarks, and that's where season one comes to an end. So in season two, to replace Dell, the cartel sends their American lawyer, Helen Pierce, who is a real boss bitch. They try to cover up Dell's death, but Helen's like, don't mess with me, we know the Snells killed him. And the only way to make it right, they killed one of the cartel's top guys, so now they gotta kill one of their own. Darlene loved that guy like a son, though. She does not approve. And so, with that little snafu out of the way, things settle down to a nice new normal. The birds are out of immediate danger, now they just have to open a casino. And it's Wendy Bird who takes point on the legal side. She used to work in politics, knows how the game's played. The big player in the Ozarks is Charles Wilkes, who takes a liking to Wendy and is happy to help out, and Wendy's willing to play dirty, blackmailing senators to get the casino approved. But Charlie's not helping just for friendship. He wants to build a whole entertainment district around the casino. Unfortunately, the Snells own the land, and they're barely willing to build a casino. They'll never go for it. So Wilkes is like, forget it, I'm out. But Wendy tricks him into accepting cartel money for his charity, so now he's implicated. She blew up their friendship, but is getting the casino. But there's illegal obstacles, too. You can't open a casino without approval from the Kansas City mob. Luckily, Marty knows someone with Casey Mob connections. It's old man and Buddy. Yes, he's friends with the leader Frank Cosgrove from their days back in Detroit. And so with Buddy vouching for Marty, Frank's in, the mob just needs their cut. Now Marty continues to trust Ruth with more and more responsibilities because she's very effective at getting things done. She delegates her strip club duties to mama's boy realtor guy who is not well suited for the job, but falls in love with the first stripper he sees. But now with her uncle's dead, her bad dad Cade Langmore is paroled from prison to be the guardian for her cousins. Ruth wants her dad to be impressed with how well she's doing working for Marty, but he's not impressed. He robs a diner for no reason and is just really a bad guy. Meanwhile, Rachel from the Blue Cat is on a drug bender, soon ends up in prison, and right there to catch her is Special Agent Petty. He has her wear a wire against Marty, and though he doesn't get much, he gets enough to get a warrant to search his house. Marty's too smart to hide stuff in his house, though. They're gonna find nothing. But he doesn't need to actually find anything. The feds just talking to you will make the cartel suspicious. Marty vouches for Ruth, even though he actually just learned she tried to kill him earlier. But the cartel's gotta test her themselves. They put her through the company onboarding seminar. And Ruth's a tough cookie. She doesn't show it, but she's a little traumatized. But now the problem is the Snell's poppy field. Helen's like, hey, you have to burn it before the feds find it, but that's millions of dollars. They'd rather take their chances. So old man Buddy, who at this point is part of the family, volunteers to go on down there and burn it himself. It's the most fun he's had in years. Unfortunately, though, just then his heart finally gives out and he dies. And so Agent Petty's whole investigation has come up empty. But that night talking to Rachel, Marty almost implicates himself and she kisses him to shut him up. She reveals she's wearing a wire. Agent Petty's pretty erratic. She does not trust him. So she and Marty have one quick real kiss and she leaves her good this time. Now the nice boat preachers become a crazy homeless preacher living on the street with his baby. So pretty soon child services takes his kid away, but then he kidnaps Wendy. He blames her. Marty pulls some crazy strings to get his baby back, but he still doesn't trust him. He's too far gone. He's going to kill Wendy now. So Marty shoots this guy, bleeds out in front of him. Marty is extremely scarred by this. It's his wife, Wendy, who's got to help him through it and pick up the slack running the business. So now the birds have a new baby, Zeke, and it's time for family breakfast to check in on the kids. This season, Jonah opens his own offshore account and starts laundering some funds, while Charlotte loses all respect for her parents' authority 
authority. In fact, she tries to become an emancipated minor, but ultimately doesn't. Meanwhile, Darlene Snell still does not approve of working with the Mexicans. He's a little worried his wife's gonna try to kill him, and he was right, she poisoned his coffee. It's a strange kind of touching farewell as she's like, honey, I love you, but I had to do this. And he's like, oh, Darlene, I love you too. I ain't even mad. So now Darlene's gonna stop the casino deal, but she has one request that would make her reconsider. All season, she's wanted to adopt a baby, and now she specifically wants baby Zeke. Wendy's like, yo, you killed his mother. Absolutely not. But ultimately, they have no other choice, so they give baby Zeke to Darlene. Darlene. Meanwhile, Ruth still desperately craves her bad dad's approval. She agrees to help him steal Marty's cash, but he doesn't keep it in the funeral home like she thought. Turns out Marty's found a fantastic new hiding spot inside Buddy's mausoleum. After this, Ruth realizes her dad is awful and decides to cut ties with him for good. So Cade goes to Agent Petty, hoping to take down Marty, but it's like, hey, you don't even know Marty. What are you doing here? And Cade's got a temper. Oh, he attacks him, kills this guy by Agent Petty. So Cade goes back to Ruth like, hey, I'm gonna skip town. Give me all the cash you got, or I'm gonna tell Wyatt you killed his father. Yes, Wyatt's been real depressed about his father's death. They have imaginary jam sessions and he's been investigating it. But now Ruth has to come clean. I'm so sorry, but I killed your dad and Wyatt does not take it well. So Cade is real desperate now. He goes after Charlotte Bird for some reason and this crosses a line. Wendy pays him to get out of town. So now, after all the crazy obstacles, the birds are finally opening their casino. But Marty has made plans to skip town. He's like, Wendy, we're never gonna be safe here. We gotta run. But Wendy's been talking to Helen, who's like, hey, you guys are out of the doghouse now. The cartel's really impressed with what you've done here. You've got a bright future with us. Wendy's like, yo, Marty, I'm not running. We're not gonna be safer by leaving the cartel. We're gonna be safer by getting further in. And turns out Wendy didn't actually pay Cade to leave town. She had the cartel assassinate him. Oh, Wendy, bird, did you just put out a hit on a guy? She comes clean to Ruth and it's complicated, but Ruth understands. But when Marty finds out, he's now a little bit terrified of who his wife's becoming. And that's where season two comes to an end with the Bird family sticking it out in the Ozarks. So in season three, the Birds are the proud new owners of a riverboat casino. Ruth Langmore is his right-hand woman, been promoted to casino manager. Part of her job is coordinating cash drops with the Kansas City mob who's in charge of transportation. But her coworker there is Frank Cosgrove's son, Frank Jr., who's just a real D-bag. He goes too far, threatening her one night, and Ruth's not taking that. She kicks him in the nuts and throws him right off the boat. This is very much against mob rules though. Frank Jr. is supposed to be untouchable. So to smooth things over, Marty's got to give them an even bigger cut, but as part of it, he marks Ruth as untouchable too. So besides that little snafu, things have settled into a nice new normal. But down in Mexico, Marty's employer is now at war with a rival cartel. Now Wendy Bird sees an opportunity here. She has the idea to expand into legitimate businesses as a safety net. In case their boss is killed, he'll be able to pass it down to his kids legally. Marty hates this idea. He doesn't want to get deeper in. He still wants to get out. And in fact, the birds fight more than ever this season. They start going to couples therapy where they talk out their problems in very vague terms, but it's not really working because Marty is bribing the therapist to take his side. But Wendy thinks her idea is a good one and takes it to Helen, who takes it to their boss, who wants a personal meeting with Wendy. And so she gets to meet Omar Navarro, the cartel leader. Like many powerful people, he's mostly soft-spoken. Wendy gives him her elevator pitch and he's just like, good, make it happen. So now the plan is to buy a second riverboat casino, one that's failing because a better one opened across the street. But Marty wants the deal to fall through. He's working against Wendy. In fact, he goes to his new friends at the Kansas City mob and has them sabotage the fireworks display on the new casino, blowing it up. So now the owners don't want to sell. But Ruth's been investigating anti-cheating technology and they decide to use it on offense, get jackpots on all their slot machines. Wendy's gotten really good at playing dirty. So the deal goes through, but that attracts the attention of the FBI again. Expanding to another casino so quickly has given them cause for an audit, making it nearly impossible to launder. The lead investigator this time is Agent Maya Miller, who's real friendly type, but really good at her job. One way Marty tries to keep laundering is with Sissy Mom's boy realtor. This season he proposes to his stripper girlfriend with a diamond made out of his dead mom. Okay. He actually inherited a lot of money from his mother and now the birds have him lose it at their casino and they'll pay him back, which Wendy assures him is not illegal. Turns out it is illegal though, and by the end of the season, Agent Miller catches him. So with Marty now secretly working against his wife, he bugs her phone and turns out she's been having late night convos with their boss Navarro. He just calls to talk about his feelings because he kind of likes her. But being a drug lord, he soon discovers someone's listening in and soon discovers it's Marty. So he abducts Marty down to Mexico to meet him in person, where he's given a room with a view and authentic Mexican food. It's also a test to see if the Ozark crew can keep laundering without Marty, and Ruth has learned a lot, but long story short, not enough. Turns out Marty is something special. He's really good at manipulating financial systems. And so Marty, having survived, 
survived what he thought was definitely the end makes up with his wife, they're a team again, for now. Now there's a new member of the family this season when Wendy's younger brother Ben comes to stay with him. Uncle Ben's an awesome free-spirited dude who quickly settles into Buddy's old role, but he is severely bipolar and when off his meds is pretty erratic. And so it's time for family breakfast, let's check in on the kids. Charlotte has matured a lot this season, she's down to help the family now, starts working for her mom on the legal side of things. Jonah gets a drone and uses it to peep on Helen Pierce's daughter who's staying with her mom for the summer. There's a whole thing where she has a crush on this bad boy, but by the end, it's Jonah she picks. Yeah, he has his first kiss. Now, Wyatt Langmore got into college last season, but after Ruth told him she killed his dad, he's not going. He's living the dream, squatting in rich people's vacation homes, but that eventually gets him into trouble. Ruth tries to bail him out, but he doesn't want anything to do with her, and Darlene Snell happened to be there is like, I'll pay the kids bail. Now, Darlene still has baby Zeke, and Wendy absolutely hates that. In fact, she goes to pick a fight with her one day, calls her a redneck. Well, that did it. She tries to get custody taken away, but Wyatt was there as a witness, like, yo, Wendy started it. So Darlene gets to keep baby Zeke for now. So Darlene and Wyatt have become real close, maybe too close, they start doing it. I try not to judge, but there's a bit of an age difference. Meanwhile, Agent Maya Miller has a deal for Marty. She knows he'll never testify against the cartel, but she has a different option. He's so good at what he does, if he pleads guilty to a separate offense, then he can come work for the FBI to catch other money launderers. He'd serve 18 months in prison, so the cartel knows he didn't rat, and then he'd be free. Before his Mexico trip, Marty wanted to take this deal, but now he's got a different plan. He wants to help her solve other financial crimes while not taking any deal and still working for the cartel, but she's like, Marty, you can't have your cake and eat it too. Now, Wendy hates this idea of turning an FBI agent, and she and Marty start arguing more than ever. In fact, now Wendy tries to bribe the therapist to take her side, and finally the therapist's like, yo, you both bribed me. This sets off their biggest fight yet. It looks like their marriage might be fully over. But they forgot the therapist was in the room. They spoke pretty explicitly about the cartel. Marty's got to give her an even bigger bribe to stay quiet, but she uses it to buy a sports car, and Helen Pierce is like, oh, hell nah. That's an unacceptable security risk, because she has her silenced permanently. Meanwhile, Ben has a huge crush on Ruth, and no one's really flirted with her before, she's not sure what's happening. But he takes her on her dream date of putting birdseed on Frank Jr.'s car, messing with Frank Jr. is the way to her heart. Unfortunately, Ben's bipolar medication makes it hard to get hard, so he decides to get off his meds and get it on. He and Ruth fall in love. But now he's acting erratic again, made worse because he saw Marty abducted to Mexico. They gotta tell him about the cartel, and he does not take the news well. Then there's a new big problem with Ruth's next money drop with the KC Mo they park far away just to mess with her, but that saves her life when men from the Lagunas cartel come and kill them all. Yeah, the cartel wars just crossed the border. Frank Jr. thinks it's pretty sus Ruth survived, thinks she set his men up, and he touches her. Touches her so hard, he almost kills her. This was very much against the rules, so Marty's like, yo, our deal's off. We're cutting ties. But to Ruth, that's kind of a cop-out. I'm supposed to be untouchable. You gotta retaliate. And Ruth being hurt sends Ben off the deep end. He crashes his sister's fancy fundraiser, punches Marty in the face. Then he makes things much worse when he goes to Helen Pierce's house and starts yelling at her about working for the cartel in front of her daughter, who the one rule was she can't know. So before Helen can have him killed, Wendy takes her brother on the run. But he keeps buying burner phones and calling Helen, trying to apologize. He's not getting the situation. Finally, Wendy realizes there's nowhere she can take her brother where he'll be safe. So they sit down for one last brother-sister dinner. Wendy goes to the bathroom, but she never comes back. Instead, Helen's cartel killer comes. Oh, Wendy gave up her brother to keep the peace. It totally breaks her. Wendy takes a few days off to process her emotions with a nice staycation in the Walmart parking lot. And when she gets home, this has put things in perspective. She and Marty work their issues out. For Ruth, though, this went too far. Wendy killed her dad and now her boyfriend. She's like, sorry, Marty, it's been real, but I quit. So now Wyatt Langmore patches things up with his cousin. Darlene's been telling him, hey, it's not Ruth's fault. It's that Marty bird. And Darlene takes advantage of Ruth and Marty's split. She tracks down Frank Jr. and blows his dick off. Yeah, messing with Frank Jr. is the way to Ruth's heart. And Darlene somehow smooths things over with his dad, like, hey, we can go to war, or you can get rich partnering with me on my heroin. So Ruth and Wyatt Langmore are now working for Darlene Snell. Jonah is also very upset by his Uncle Ben's death. In fact, he busts into Helen's with a gun for revenge. But she's like, hey kid, it was your mom who made the call in the end, so now Jonah's real mad. So now Helen's like, Wendy, you did the right thing. Let's move forward, put this behind us. But she secretly goes to Navarro like, hey, the birds are trouble magnets. You need to kill them and put me in charge. But the birds figure out Helen's coming for them. They need a plan to be more valuable. And the answer is the cartel war, which is not going well, Navarro is losing. But if a cartel commits violence on American soil, like how the Lagunas cartel attacked their truck, 
then the U.S. government can go down to retaliate, so the birds hope to get to the U.S. government to win the cartel war for Navarro. But when the birds are summoned to Mexico, Maya gives him some bad news. Turns out Helen's play was to negotiate a fake deal for Marty with the FBI, making it look like he's snitching. So Navarro's probably gonna kill him, but it's too late to turn back now. So down in Mexico, things look bleak for the birds. Is this the end? But oh no, it's Helen that they kill. Navarro's like, what's up, birds? You guys are fun. I like you better. So now, Marty and Wendy Bird in deeper with the cartel than ever, and their family is safe for now. But long-term job security seems iffy. And that's where Ozark Season 3 comes to an end. If you like this recap, hit that subscribe button for more of the best recaps of TV and movies. And if you love this recap, check out the join button and support the channel as a member.